So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Thanks for having me. The, um, the first thing I want to talk about um, was just ask who your audience is. Um, so I've seen accusations that your first book, The Positive Birth Movement, um, which for me was massively in influential and instrumental in me having a really positive birth experience. Uh, I've seen criticisms that it's for crazy hippie ladies um, <laughs> who don't want to listen to their doctors. Okay. Um, so who are you writing for? Um, well, first of all, I suppose I have to be honest and say that I, you know, although I don't particularly necessarily look like a hippie, I probably do see myself as a hippie because I would see that as a compliment. You know, for me, a hippie is somebody who thinks outside the box, asks questions, um, you know, wants to explore different options, etc. So if that's what a hippie is, then I'm happy to take that label. Um, but I've always tried um, to write in a way and to, to talk about birth and start conversations about birth in a way that's inclusive of all choices. So, um, you know, all of the stuff that I've done has been around positive birth rather than a particular type of birth. So it's not really hippie stuff, really, unless by hippie you mean thinking outside the box, <laughs> in which case it is, which is fine by me. And how did you start writing about birth? Well, um, I kind of came into it through strange routes, as we always do in life. Um, I, um, when I first became a mum myself 11 years ago, um, I was working as a, a drama therapist, which is a type of creative arts psychotherapy. Um, and slowly as I got through to having my second child, it started to become more and more difficult to sustain that career path. And um, I was at home with a baby and a toddler, and I started writing um, a blog. And uh, on the blog, I covered all different topics, motherhood, breastfeeding, my own personal experiences. And I also wrote about birth. And whenever I wrote about birth, I got this kind of like big response. So it was kind of like everybody was saying, yes, say more about that, say more about that. <laughs> So, and that then led to me writing, doing freelance journalism, um, again, about mainly about birth for people like The Telegraph and The Guardian. So, and that then led to the books. Yeah, um, and so you knew that you were writing something that people wanted to hear and needed to hear. Yeah, it was like, you know, it's just one of those being in the right place and saying the right things at the right time thing. It was everybody wanted a new narrative about birth. I think everybody was fed up with hearing the same old tropes of all that matters is a healthy baby and all of that kind of stuff. And the, 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 the internet exploding at the same time brought new opportunities for women to have conversations with women in different parts of the world, you know, through social media, et cetera, that meant they could sort of start actually talking to each other about birth, seeing images of birth, seeing films of birth and sharing their stories. And it kind of all happens with synchronicity, I think, yeah. along with the stuff that I was writing about. So it wasn't by any means just me. It was like a kind of whole movement that was gathering of people sort of reclaiming the, the narrative about birth, I think. And so when did your, your writing about birth become a movement, become the Positive Birth Book? Well, um, I, because I'd become more and more interested in birth and was writing about birth, I trained as a doula. So if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's like a kind of like childbirth companion, someone who's with you while you're having a baby, but not in a medical capacity. Um, and I was becoming more and more interested and passionate about the issues around birth. And actually kind of looking back on it, I can see that that was the feminist issues that were attracting me the most. Um, and so because I trained as a doula, I decided to set up a group in my house um, uh, once a month where women could come and just talk to each other about birth rather than being an antenatal class or a yoga group or whatever, or a hypnobirthing lesson. I just thought, you know, in my own pregnancies, I'd felt I really wanted to have that space where I could just like hear, what are you going to do? What choices are you making? Why? What's happening to you? What's your consultant say? What's your midwife doing? Oh, you're doing this. You know, I just wanted that kind of like space to talk to the women. So I thought, well, I'm going to set up a group like that in my house. And at the same time, I was noticing, wow, on social media, we've got these conversations widening out. This woman in Newcastle who's been told she's got to have a cesarean because blah, can suddenly talk to not just the other people around her in her social circle, but she can talk to people everywhere in the world. And the power that that was bringing to that woman in Newcastle was great because it was like she could then go back to her consultant and say, well, so-and-so in this area has been told this and I've been told this. So you know, because there are so many discrepancies in the messages and the information that women get when they're pregnant. So those ideas kind of came together for me. And I thought, well, rather than just little old me running my group in the middle of nowhere, why don't other people set these groups up? And then we could use social media to link them up. And then we'd have this kind of like power network where people could actually communicate with each other 
all under the same umbrella. So that was where the idea of the positive birth movement came from. It was one of those kind of like late night ideas where you think, yeah, that's a good idea. And you kind of like type something about it. And then you wake up in the morning and like, you're like, oh, oh my God, you know, my inbox is like rams. Yeah, well, that's brilliant that you did it while you were in that moment of I should do this mad thing. You didn't wake yeah. up the next morning and go, Oh no! That I know. Is idea. <laughs> well, that's what I always say: is that if I'd realised what I was starting, I probably wouldn't have started it because it's like was, has become so massive and such a huge responsibility for me um, that you know for seven years now I've been running it, and you know it's it's an amazing thing, but it's also kind of like become this huge thing which is far bigger than me, um, and uh, you know it's quite quite a big responsibility. But yeah, it's it's been an amazing response, and like I say again, I think that was because everybody was out there saying. We want different information. We want a different conversation. And the positive birth movement just helped bring that together, really. And then, obviously, that that's why it's called, my first book was called The Positive Birth Book, because it kind of is obvious. But the two aren't connected in the sense yeah. that I'm a writer who wrote a book. But I also run an organization. That, so they are related, but they're not. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, they don't sort of segue completely. Yeah. Um, and so you've now written Give Birth Like a Feminist. And what was the aim with writing that after you'd written Positive Birth Book? Well, um, I think it was just um, a coming together for me of like, why have I got into this crazy place <laughs> in the first place? So it was kind of, after the Positive Birth book was published, it became very successful. And because of that, I got a literary agent. And we sat and had a conversation the first time I met her. And she was like, well, tell me about your ideas for the next book. So I kind of like, I went to her with a sort of scribbled back of an envelope, you know, of like about five or six different ideas. And right at the bottom, I'd written in like really small writing, give birth like a feminist, thinking, she's going to think that's a really dumb idea. And um, when I got, after I'd gone through them all, she said, that's the one. That's the one we should do. So I was like, OK. So it was really because of her, and I think, again, with the beauty of hindsight, I think it was partly um, Me Too that had happened about a year before that conversation, the Me Too movement, hashtag Me Too, that had kind of started to, again, shift that conversation, and, and people who were outside, people who were inside the birth world completely were like, yeah, birth's a feminist issue. But outside the birth world, those people like literary agents and publishers, I think they were able to see it as a feminist issue and see, yes, that there is a place for this book in the mainstream um, because of Me Too, because of the sort of new ways of thinking about women's autonomy that Me Too brought. Yeah, because that was going to be my next question was, you know, calling it Give Birth Like a Feminist is quite a statement. And to say to a wider audience that birth is a feminist issue, yeah. Um, but that was your first idea that was you came with, it's got to be Give Birth Like a Feminist. Yeah, well, that was my, the title was my idea, but there was rumblings for quite a long time because when you go through the process of writing a book, you sort of do a proposal and that goes out to publish. And I think some publishers did say no to it because of the title and because of the sort of, you know, the sort of, oh, I can't really compute those. You know, not everybody was ready to put those two ideas together, let's say. Um, and then I think the, the publishers who did publish it did have conversations that I wasn't part of about the title, which is what they do, and that's fine. But um, I think they were sort of thinking, is this going to put people off? Because, and that's fair enough, that's yeah. their job <laughs> to ask those questions. Um, but obviously, there is, people do get worried about the word feminist sometimes, don't they? And it does make people think, oh, is this going to be kind of all aggressive or something? And I'm not going to like it. And um, so, but I think again, the world is moving quite rapidly in that area. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, since Me Too, and we've had people like Meghan Markle putting on her Buckingham Palace um, biography that she's a feminist, and so people are using that word in in a way that they weren't five years ago, yeah. really, and and in in the mainstream, and it's it's become a bit you know a bit more palatable for people, hopefully. Yeah. And I mean, the words that we use around birth is one of the one of the themes of the positive birth book. And what you write generally is that we use certain words around birth that are unhelpful. We can use other words that are helpful. Um, so why do you think that words and vocabulary around birth are important? Well, I think words, you know, obviously what words are what I like and I'm good at. So I notice words um, as a writer and I think, um, you know, the words are like a sort of a tip of an iceberg, really, aren't they? So. One of the things that I noticed first as a pregnant woman 11 years ago, for 
pregnant for the first time and also like after I'd had my baby when I was hearing other people tell their birth stories, friends, family, people at the toddler group, was I kept hearing I wasn't allowed or they didn't let me and those words kept sticking out for me and I was thinking this is really interesting because the way um, what happened was was that I went over I went past my due date and I actually went to sort of I think I was induced in the end but I was induced at 42 weeks in three days I think it was or it might be two days and um whenever I told my whole birth story you know like and this is amazing that was amazing this happened that happened and then I get to that bit and they were like 42 weeks and through that was the thing that struck everyone like I didn't think you were allowed to do that so <laughs> um it really struck me that people was, were had this confusion about what you were actually allowed to do with your own body and yet that was kind of at odds for me with like progress that had been made in areas of other women's lives you know 20 this was the 21st century we were quite a long way on from the 60s and you know <laughs> women's liberation so yeah it's like wow that's amazing that we're still talking about birth in terms of what we're allowed and not allowed to do and yeah you know in the book I cover a whole other range of phrases like um, failure to progress, um, which sometimes gets written on people's birth notes, you know, incompetent cervix, um, my woman in room three, um, good girl is a phrase that sometimes is used, you know, he healthcare professional to woman. Um, and yeah, there's lots of phrases and words around birth that I think it's probably time that we challenged. And delivery is another one, actually, that a lot of people hate that, you know, because, uh, and I don't mind it so much if it's on the, in the context of women delivering their babies. I, if I ever do use it, I try to use it in that way. But what is really awful is when you hear the story of like the woman who gave birth, uh, you know, by the side of the road and the dad heroically delivered the <laughs> yeah. baby <laughs> or the midwives deliver the baby. And a lot of people say, well, babies are born, pizzas are delivered. Yeah. But also if anyone does the delivering, it's definitely the woman. Yeah. <laughs> anyone yeah. who's done it can reassure you of that. <laughs> yeah, all the hard work the dad was doing, just waiting to catch. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned this sort of, it being surprising in the 21st century um, with everything that's gone on and you know, being in a position as a woman where you're not often told what you can and can't do, fortunately anymore, but actually developments in the 21st century have had arguably a negative impact on, on birth and child, childbirth practices. Um, so I'd love to <coughs> talk a bit about natural birth, how it's been interfered with um, in the recent medical history um, and the impact that having a natural birth can have on a woman. Okay, yeah. So first of all, I suppose I need to make a sort of caveat, which is um, I'm not a natural birth crusader and that any, you know, I, I, my interest mainly is in making birth more positive for women and that is up to women themselves to say how that can be done, not me. Um, but at the same time, I do think that we need as women and as feminists to have a conversation about natural birth because at the moment, nat truly natural birth, where there is no, nothing else apart from the woman having a baby, is almost extinct. And as women and as feminists, we need to have a conversation about whether that matters to us, not to Millie Hill, <laughs> it's not up to me, but whether it matters to us as, as women and as humans actually, not just women, um, you know, men and women as the human race going forwards, does this have a value to us or not? Um, even births that get chalked up um, as a tick in the natural birth box. There's been research done to show that when you actually break them down and ask more questions and look at the notes, you'll find that actually they weren't as natural as all that. Maybe the woman was induced, maybe there was forceps, maybe she had an um, injection to make the placenta come out. So, or maybe she had her labor augmented in some way, or maybe her waters were artificially broken. So, you know, there are lots of births that on paper may get the tick in there. Oh yes, I had a natural birth, but actually really true natural birth is really rare. And ha what I call, and some women call, hands-off birth, which is when the midwife stays in the background and nothing really happens to the woman apart from her midwife's presence, unless it's needed. <clears throat> Those sorts of births are even rarer and almost impossible to get. And in fact, most people who do get them have to go outside the system to get them and have, you know, employ an independent midwife, or even some women will free birth so that they can have that hands-off experience. Um, and, you know, 
It has been identified by people like the World Health Organization and um, a recent um, uh, thing in the, the journal, medical journal, The Lancet, has described our Western approach of too much too soon. So there is, there is too much intervention in birth. The difficult conversation is what do we do about that and how do, I, how do we identify which interventions are necessary and which are unnecessary and it's very complicated. In the book, writing about the history of birth from sort of like the 15th century witch hunts and you know midwives being burned all the way through the sort of twilight sleep and you know all kinds of different developments through the history of birth is quite interesting. What you also see through that is a gradual um, isolation of the woman. You know, you go from um, a birth being a kind of community event where a woman would have been attended by sisters, wise women, people in the know, um, and it would have been a kind of loving um, help, you know, like everyone coming together to help this woman, maybe singing to her, bringing her special food, singing her special songs, giving her massages, comforting her. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, let's go back to that and chuck out all the medical advances of the 21st century, I'm not saying that. Um, but we need to think about how can we return to some of, bring some of the element back into birth, because that's kind of what we've lost. As we've come through history, we see women being put on the bed, on their backs, to make it more easier for the obstetrician or the doctor to, to see or to use the forceps. And we see women turning to hardcore pain relief, like twilight sleep, like epidural, as a response, in a way, to the situation that they're in, they're wanting to absent themselves from it in some way because it's awful. <laughs> so, we, you know, it's quite a complicated thing to unravel, isn't it? When you actually get to the present day and you think where we are now, you think actually it's quite complicated, isn't it? To try and think how can we, how can we keep all those wonderful advances, those life-saving advances of modern obstetrics, but somehow get back to the roots of birth and bring back more of that kind of loving touch in birth where a woman is Com brought comfort and nurture um, with the, the with the backup, the medical backup yeah. in the background. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, putting women back in the centre of the experience and feeling in control. I mean, that's one of the messages. And you made a really important point, and the point is made in your book. It's not about achieving a natural birth or advocating a particular kind of birth, but it's about educating women, knowing what the options are, knowing what choices you have, and having people make an informed choice yeah. of what's right for them. Absolutely. And, you know, natural birth becomes more possible if we do less. And that's the hard thing, I think, for modern obstetrics to get its head around. Modern obstetrics comes at birth from a problem-solving, slightly masculine patriarchal angle, if I might say. And what is what needs to be done is not like, what can we do to fix this problem, but what can we not do? <laughs> you know, when you look at stats from um, care providers, you know, midwives who are more hands off, you will see that they've got 80 to 90% of women in their care from all backgrounds, from all risk factors, having a straightforward natural vaginal birth. Well, note that is not the figures that we have in the kind of mainstream system in the UK or many other places in the world today. And women are coming through that situation feeling that they have failed, that their bodies have failed because they weren't able to proceed through that labor without intervention and help. But actually, there are those other women who there's nothing different about these women. They're not like different, a different kind of category of magical human who's, who are going through different approach who, are, who have a better chance. Not 100%, <laughs> it's, but a much, much better chance of having a straightforward natural vaginal birth. And if, if women, want, not all women want that, but if the women who do should have, we should be looking at how can we improve their chances yeah. of getting it. And so what is the main thing that you want birthing women and their birth partners to know about birth, do you think? Well, I think one important thing, I think, is that it is not potluck. <laughs> um, I think that is a damaging myth that um, people are told. Uh, well, just go with the flow, you know, it'll just whatever happens on the day will happen. Don't get yourself too tied up in knots about it. Don't, don't make, bother making a birth plan. It's just, you know, potluck. It isn't potluck. You cannot um, 
guarantee that you are going to get the birth you want. I'm not telling anybody that, but you can maximize your chances of having a better birth by using your brain and by thinking about it and learning about it and um, making a plan and learn, knowing your options and knowing that you have rights and knowing that you have bodily autonomy and all of these things and choosing a really good support, the best you can afford really, a good doula, maybe an independent midwife if you can afford that or just spend some, you know, if you can't afford to have an independent midwife at your birth, you know, go to an antenatal class with her or, or you know, you know, just do everything you can to kind of learn and take, take back some control. Um, I think that is important and that that isn't pointless. It is not, po and also think about where you want to give birth. You know, the default place for most of us in the UK anyway is hospital, but we've got a lot of evidence now to show that that isn't necessarily the safest place. Um, a midwife led unit or a birth center um, for a first time um, mum and even home, um, which is quite shocking to us because we're like, well, no, home is a really dangerous choice. Everyone kind of got that programmed in somewhere, but actually the evidence doesn't support that. The evidence supports home as a safe choice, even for women in their first, first pregnancy. Um, you know, there are, there are some figures to look at. You can look at the birthplace study. You can look at the NICE guidelines. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not a, a crazy idea to think about, well, maybe I'll stay at home and then maybe I'll go to hospital if I feel like it. You yeah. know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. You know, you can really explore all those options. Think about your choices. Yeah. I and I, for me personally, that's what I did. You know, actually having read the Positive Birth book and seeing the statistics and I at some point thought maybe I'll have a home birth and some people thought it was completely mad but it's taking the statistics that say that there is a marginally higher risk if you're it's your first child having a home birth and then considering the other factors so i was five minutes from a very good hospital exactly and so that to me is a huge difference to someone who's even half an hour away i knew yeah, that totally. if i needed to i could be in hospital very quickly and so that influenced my decision and made me comfortable that it was still the right place for me to give birth yeah and yeah, that, I think to me that's the value of the movement is helping people to inform themselves. Yeah, become informed and think about your options, your personal options. Don't let anyone give you sort of blanket advice that is applicable to every woman because you need to think about, like, as you did, you need to think about, well, what kind of health am I in? What's my mental attitude like? What's my support like? What's my house like? How far am I from the hospital? How do I feel about this? Where do I feel safest? Not what do I think I'm safest, where do yeah. I feel safest? And that's another important thing that a lot of people don't think about necessarily is to think of your think about yourself as a mammal. And it's like, whoa, you know, because <laughs> it's kind of me and you know, birth. I think that's partly part of the problem is that women we've become a bit um, removed from our our animal side. <laughs> you know, blue water on the on the period adverts and hair, hairless, you know people running down the beach with, you know, not seeing any body hair. And it, you've got to re just slightly remind yourself that you are a mammal and that when you give birth, your mammalian side is in, in full action. Um, so, you know, the, the, the birth hormone oxytocin, you can't give birth without producing oxytocin. Um, if you don't produce oxytocin, you'll be given oxytocin, synthetic oxytocin to make you have that baby. Um, so think about how am I going to, you know, you only produce oxytocin in an environment where you feel safe, uninterrupted, undisturbed, just like your cat might go and find the bottom of the wardrobe and hide away in the dark to have her kittens because she's a mammal. And that's kind of like what women need to do. So, you know, where, where can you get that environment? And if you do choose to have a hospital birth or you want to have a hospital birth, you still need to think, how can I make this hospital room an oxytocin rich environment for me? because otherwise you, your labour won't progress because it can't without oxytocin. Yeah. Simple information like that. <laughs> and do you think that there's a risk um, of women feeling like having a good birth is something else that they have to achieve? Um, if we're saying you put more power back in women's hands, do you, do you think that'll just become another burden as well as having it all? Um, not really. <laughs> no, because um, I don't think... I don't think that we set women up to fail. I think women already know what they want. Um, most women want to have a birth that goes the way they want. Um, um, in a straight, for a lot of women, that's in a straightforward way. You know, hands up who wants a forceps delivery. Not many people are going to like say, "Yeah, that sounds great. I'd really like that." So, um, you know, some people may want to have a cesarean, and that's their choice, and that's fine. But you know, 
I, I, this idea that we're setting women up to fail by informing them that they have choices, I think is a strange one that I, I do hear it a lot. You know, and also when you get to the other side of birth, if you're feeling awful about the birth, that's, you know, maybe speaking with my former therapist hat on here, but that's normal. Yeah. If you've had a life experience that was upsetting for you, it wasn't the way you wanted it to be, and parts of it were maybe distressing or traumatic or you didn't like, then you will feel sad, you know, upset, disappointed. You'll have those feelings. We don't have to tell women, oh, you shouldn't be having those feelings. The only reason you feel like that is because of that crazy hypnobirthing woman putting all those ideas yeah. in your head, or you shouldn't have made that birth plan, then you wouldn't be feeling that way. In a way, it's almost like when we do that, it feels like we're blaming the woman um, and we're taking the focus off the birth system, which is, the, it's the birth system that should be reflecting on what they could have done differently, yeah. um, not the woman. So I don't really buy into the whole kind of like, you know, don't get your hopes up narrative because I think that women do get their hopes up because they're about to have a baby it's a momentous occasion in their life they've got every right to get their hopes up and to have a strong sense of how they want it to be and a sense of entitlement and a sense of worth and yeah. you know to want to have a, an empowering experience whatever that means for them and what's the impact been of the positive birth movement that you've seen well I think it's been amazing really and I think it's um you know obviously it's part of a much wider change it's not all um down to the positive birth movement but i think you know and again like i said earlier on about social media i think that that has played a huge role in changing women's way of looking at birth as well so i think it's been really positive because women have been able to share their stories with each other in different ways and i think we've still got a long way to go and it, I, I some days i feel really optimistic and other days i feel like oh this is a bit of a Difficult battle yeah. in a way. Um, well, because one thing that you haven't, you, you absolutely aren't saying is that doctors and obstetricians should, are unnecessary. No. And so are you starting to see that message be understood and are you starting to see changes in their practices? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of good things happening. Um, it's, it, but it's pockets and it's the overall, obviously there's some amazing individuals what we need is the cultural change, and I'm not sure that's happening yeah. yet. I'm going to take some questions from the room. Um, Thank I was you. really interested in your talk because I'm planning um, next year to potentially become pregnant, but I'm terrified, absolutely terrified. From all the reasons you've said, um, but I'm really curious says what can go wrong. Um, where would you suggest I start? Well, first of all, I would say um, I know exactly how you feel because when I was pregnant for the first time, I was also completely terrified. That was the first thought that I had was, apart from, oh my God, I'm pregnant. I was like, oh my God, now I've got to have this baby. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so I was completely, almost the whole of my first pregnancy, I think I, my overriding emotion was fear of giving birth. Um, and I think that's pretty normal and pretty common in, in today's world. Um, so I think I would say, don't be an ostrich. <laughs> Um, it's tempting when we've got this terrifying thing looming to just bury our head in the sand and hope it's going to go away. And also to kind of like take on those messages that come around like, oh, just go with the flow and you can't really control it anyway. And so you just think, right, well, I just don't have to do anything. I'm just going to pretend it's not happening until it happens. So I'd say don't do that. And, um, you know, try and slowly replace that fear with facts. Think about what you're afraid of. I'm not going to go into it with you here <laughs> specifically, but think about what is it in particular that you're afraid of and then try and learn, is that actually true? Because I think a lot of us have got, have absorbed information about birth that isn't actually true. And there's a lot of like, I mean, I, I quite often want to give talks, talk about the hooping a bowling ball thing or a watermelon thing that you get told, you know, things like that. And people go, oh, it's so funny. You know? And then when you're pregnant, you're like, oh, it's not funny at all. <laughs> it's also um, not surprising. Yeah. That was going to be my approach. I don't want to know anything. Yeah. Like, but it's not surprising when your whole image is, you know, films and movies, TV, that, that doesn't show a realistic picture of birth. And that's kind of what we see until you get to a point you're actually pregnant and thinking, Oh, what's this really going to be like? Yeah, and that was going to be the other thing that I suggested as well, is that when you feel ready, try and um, think about images and even films. And I know I can tell you, I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but I was too scared to watch any birth films in my first pregnancy. That's how scared I was. 
because the, all I, the only frame of reference I had was either like one one every minute, which I found absolutely horrific, uh, or the school video that they showed me of like this woman in like a Laura Ashley dress and like 1980s glasses <laughs> on a bed looking like really distressed and people panicking around her and that sort of thing. So those were the only sort of images of birth that I had. So it took me until my second pregnancy to try and look at different birth films. And I've actually put together on the Positive Birth Movement website, there's a whole like entry level set of birth films for people, specifically for people who are afraid, um, where they're, they're not scary birth films. <laughs> not that they're, you know, but you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're specifically chosen to help just ease you in. And I, in my second pregnancy, I watched a, a film that absolutely changed everything for me. It was this woman, she was in this dark birth pool and she was just kind of making these mooing noises and then going quiet and the water was just rocking a bit. And then suddenly she just put her hands down and just brought this baby up to the surface. And I'm, I had never seen anyone give birth like that. And that changed everything for me. I was like, wow. Where are the other people? Because normally, you know, in like Friends or the soap opera, it's everyone's around and every, you can't, but this woman just did it. I mean, there were obviously other people in the room, but they weren't on camera and she did it. So all of those things, learning more, thinking about what you're actually afraid of and actually trying, if you can, to look at it and think about it and think, try and think about it in a positive way because it is actually an amazing experience, isn't it? Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but it is. it can be such a powerful experience and have such beauty in it. It's a big mix for me, I think. That's another really important message. I don't know how you feel about this, but it's like not like whitewashing everything and saying, oh, it's just, just all, you know, rose tinted glass. It's this beautiful candlelit everything. You know, for me, birth wasn't like that. I've had one hospital birth and two home births, and both my home births were absolutely amazing, beautiful, but my God, I had moments in them where I just thought it was the worst thing that ever happened. I hated it, I wanted it to stop. But, you know, so I think it's important that we don't have a polarized narrative about it, that there are, you know, we, we acknowledge that birth, it's, birth is like a kind of like microcosm of life. It's like it's got everything in there, um, but it is a, an incredible experience. Yeah, a sense of achievement afterwards. Yeah. You, know, you run a marathon, it's going to be painful for a lot of it. Um, but the feeling at the end, yeah. you've done it, is extraordinary. I've got some questions on that have come in virtually. Um, we'll get some more from the room. I'll take one from here. Um, so when you talk about control and selecting your choices wisely, do you have a view on the NHS versus private, given you've more control over your caregiver and you can build a relationship with them through a private system? Well, um, I think, you know, we've got a lot of evidence to show that what's called continuity of carer is the best that a woman can get in terms of safety and her personal experience of childbirth. So um, if you can get that in the NHS, then that is brilliant. Um, but if you have, you know, sometimes it's not available yet. They are working to make it more available to women. Um, but having that relationship-based care, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying about kind of getting back some of the older elements of what childbirth would have been like, you know, that relationship-based care where you, your midwife knows you, you trust them, you can lock eyes and you know that they're there and you've got that, you know, you've built a relationship with them. That is such a positive thing, um, no matter how birth goes. Um, because, you know, if you trust someone and they say, and you know them, you've known them for a few months and they say, look, this isn't going to ha this home yeah. birth you wanted or whatever it might be isn't isn't happening we need to do this now and then you don't have to have like any anxiety about whether they're giving the, you the right advice yeah. you've got that relationship with them so private i don't know it's it shouldn't have to be we need this in the nhs we need continuity based relationship based care in the nhs but we also the part of the birth conversation is thinking about people who give people in this room with bumps who are giving birth in two months time what's the best thing for them we also need to think about what's the best thing for the future and those two things might be different yeah <laughs> because we can't change everything before the, <laughs> in the next two months <laughs> and just adding up to what you said um you do get continuity care with the midwives at least in like southwest london when you apply for <laughs> when will you choose a home birth because well, in a hospital, it's really hard to have the same midwife the day, whichever day is going to be you give birth, yeah. after shifts, and in the end, you don't see the midwives of the hospital, the ones you see for the appointments. But for my second one, I did do the home birth team, and it's 
it's usually like two, three, or four midwives that take care of you during the whole pregnancy, and it's only them, the ones that are there. Yeah. So you know them all, and yeah, it's really nice to have that continuity care. And you do get it if you opt to go for, if you choose a home birth, I know for a fact that you, you yeah. Well, it doesn't, it depends where you live, but you're much more yeah. likely to get it if you choose a home birth. You're yeah. Right, yeah, it's a bit of a postcode lottery, but yeah, definitely for home births, it's better. Can you help, you said something that was really helpful for me, and I'm wondering if you'd speak a bit more and help me detangle. Um, the difference between, like, if you make a lovely plan and you've got the best of intentions and it goes poorly, actually it's okay to feel, like, a bit crummy about that afterwards, but not feel failure. Because um, with my first, I had the best of intentions, and I did all the, po and then it just didn't go that way. And what um, I'm trying not to feel like that was a failure, but also like own that, yeah, it was kind of crummy. Mm. Um, can you just talk a bit more about that? Because I, I heard you say something about that. And it was really okay. Well, I guess um, is it to do with who or what failed in that first birth experience? Um, that, that you need to maybe think about. Like for me, like I'm not talking about your sp specific experience, but just generally, I think quite often women feel that they failed or that they their body failed. Um, uh, and that is sometimes true, like but women's bodies, like in every all of our bodies, not just in birth, but they don't always work right. <laughs> um, but sometimes it's not that your body let you down, it's that the system let you down. So maybe you didn't get the, that continuity of care we've been talking about. Maybe, um, you know, you didn't feel safe during your labor. I don't want to talk too much about your situation specifically, but you know what I mean? You can think through what actually, what could have been different. Um, and it's, sometimes it is about, you know, that, that women have been, that the system could have done better for that woman, that she could have had a better chance of having that, the birth that she wanted if she'd had you know, you can trace it back. Sometimes you can, I hear a lot of birth stories, you can trace it back and think, wow, you know, when you turn up at the hospital and they said you'd already decided that you didn't want to have vaginal exams and they said they had to examine you because otherwise they couldn't admit you and then they did examine you and they said that you were only three centimeters and that maybe you should go home again or whatever, um, or whatever it is that you were told. Those moments are the moments where that's the, the first trip up for a lot of women, the first sense of being unsafe. Yeah. Um, at what point would you accept intervention or the view of a medical professional? Um, that's really like a million dollar question because it's circumstance. My dad used to say circumstances alter cases, broken noses alter faces. <laughs> that's what springs to mind there. But um, it depends um, on what's happening and what intervention you're talking about. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be in, an, no woman is going to be in a medical emergency and be start, start waving my book around and say, no, I've read this book and I'm, I don't want you to come anywhere. <laughs> you know, women want um, a healthy baby. That is what we all want. We all want to get out, out of birth with ourselves well and our babies well. And we have their, our baby's um, well-being as our main concern. So a lot of what we're talking about here is not about emergency situations where you'd be very unlikely to want to challenge the views of, of a medical team who were advising you in a certain direction. Um, th but there are a million other scenarios where you may want to take some more time to think, explore your options, ask more questions, get a second opinion. Um, I, th I don't think it's black and white. You can't say this is when you wouldn't, this is when you wouldn't. It depends yeah. on the individual person, how you feel, what you want. It's just up to you. But that's the key thing, isn't it? It's up to you. <laughs> Um, I've just got a couple of thoughts. One is which is the fact that it just felt to me like I have a three-year-old. It felt like a completely like data-free environment in that actually, if I'd have known, if someone had said to me, yes, you're 41 and you're attempting to deliver a 99 percentile head baby, like probably that was not going to go well. You've been at it for 60 hours. And I felt like I was in this battle between like mid midwives that thought I could maybe manage it and doctors that were like, you're gonna damage yourself. And actually no one had ever talked about that. I'd been to all the classes and I feel like if someone had said, there are some things that affect, that might affect your ability to have the birth that you want. I feel like that kind of information might be helpful. I always ask people about the baby's head size because it just yeah. seems like basic to me that 
The ones that slip out easily are tiny. Anyway, that's one thought. <laughs> that, that actually <laughs> isn't, that isn't true, that the ones that slip out easily are tiny, and maybe that's where we've that's where it becomes already difficult because we, we can't say that. Yeah, maybe we don't know that, but certainly that was the first thing they said when he came out was, oh my goodness, he's got a big head. And I just thought, oh. Uh, now well, you tell okay, me. Now you tell me. <laughs> you know, in your 69 hours, that, that surely someone could have checked that. Um, yeah. The second thing is, and it's just but, a potential area to explore that I feel quite strongly about, is actually what happens post birth. Oh, yeah. Because I felt like there was so much focus on the birth, like, you know, because you, 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 absolutely you're thinking about it, you're worried about it, you have to make these choices, people have got opinions, like, it's such a big thing, and of course it's a massive moment, and then suddenly you're, like, cast adrift, maybe a bit incontinent, maybe miserable, maybe completely exhausted, and there's almost nothing, and that to me is very shocking, and I realised I didn't have a clue almost have to, what to do with a baby, which just sounds ridiculous, but I'd spent months and months obsessing about a birth and had somehow missed the next bit, and mm -hmm. some of that was my fault when I was on my own, which would made it more challenging. Um, but yeah, I, I look at countries like France, where, you know, everyone has their pelvic floor exercises and all these other things, yeah. and people don't accept that your body's kind of ruined, whereas I think in the UK people accept um, things that they shouldn't, anyway, I've talked too much, but... No, no, it's, it's a really, really good point, and I totally agree. I think it's probably sort of interrelated points, just going back to your first point about big babies, you know, there isn't definitive evidence that bigger babies are harder to give birth to. Some women give birth, well, what, I, what you could say is that some women give birth to big babies easily. Some women even, I've had big babies, and some women even say, bigger babies are easier to give birth to because it's kind of like you've got gravity on your side, you've got more sort of oomph to them. <laughs> um, so there's, the, the world is divided and there isn't, so it's not like anyone could clearly say, well, your baby's this size, therefore you should definitely have a cesarean. Um, however, if you were in labor for that long, um, you know, like we were just saying, uh, in answer to the lady in front of you's question, you know, sometimes you need to go back a bit and say, well, where, where did things, it shouldn't, it shouldn't have got to that point. Where did things begin to be difficult? Or, you know, was, were there other points earlier on where there could have been, maybe you were, maybe you weren't on your back. I don't know, because like, you know, it's, I don't want to like pick over the bones of your story, because I know that, that birth stories are so powerful. Um, but, you know, maybe there were points where you could have, that things could have been done differently, you could have had different support that might have made your birth more straightforward and maybe it wasn't all down to the size. And then going forward into your second point um, about postnatal support, I think that's just, I completely 100% applaud what you said and we do need much more focus on women postnatally. Lovely Megan who just said, nobody's actually asked me if I'm okay. And she, everybody resonated with that so much, didn't they? Because God, that's just so, how you feel as a new mum is like everyone says how are they sleeping and all of that kind of stuff and are they a good baby but you don't very often get asked if you're okay so we have a huge problem with postnatal mental health huge problem with postnatal physical health not enough follow-up not enough again not enough information I sometimes feel like I don't know if I can do that too I try to sort of for my own sanity <laughs> keep my focus mainly on the, the birth room itself but you know yeah absolutely agree with you that we, sh we should have much more support. But if you had that one-to-one -one care, you know, having a midwife who keeps coming and who, who cares for you after you've had your baby, that would, you know, for more, for longer time, and who knows what kind of birth you had and can go over it with you and your physical state, etc. that would be. Um, I'm planning my birth plan um, at the moment, 19 weeks. Um, I guess, you, you know, you mentioned if things don't go necessarily as planned or if there are things that I don't want to partake in or have different opinions on. Um, I was just wondering if you could kind of help give us in the room and you know, on the line the tools and things that we should, we should be using so that we know going into it kind of how we can, you know, with authority, but you know, without getting anyone angry in, in that situation, kind of go against what they're recommending potentially. Yeah, well, first of all, just going back to the point about birth plans, um, I do always say to people, don't just make one birth plan. So think about um, your ideal birth, your plan A. It's okay for that to be as, you know, magical and sparkly as you want it to be. And, you know, like in any other area of life, it's really good to have 
a dream and a vision and it can actually help you get what you want. That's, we know that, don't we? However, it doesn't guarantee. <laughs> and so then you need to think about, OK, if I don't get this one, um, what, how do I want things to play out in, uh, in the second scenario or maybe even the third scenario? And what elements from the plan A can I retain throughout even, you know, no matter what kind of birth I end up with? Good examples of that might be skin to skin contact after you've had your baby. There aren't many births um, where you shouldn't be able to have that optimal cord clamping where um, they don't cut. I mean, cutting the cord straight away, we could talk for an hour about that, has been happening um, to all, probably all of us in this room had our umbilical cords cut straight away after we were born because it's why did they do that? They, they didn't question it. It's just what they did. And actually, to stop them doing that, we've had to, not me, but people have had to produce the evidence that it's not the right thing to do. And now we have the evidence to say we need to wait. A third of the baby's blood volume is in the placenta at birth. It carries on pumping through to the baby with full of vital stem cells and all kinds of other goodness comes through. Um, and we need to wait. And there's just been a story um, in the um, press, actually, where um, research has shown um, that we could save, I think, something like 1,500 more premature babies' lives a year just by not cutting the cord straight away. Um, so all of those sorts of things, you can, you know, they should hold no matter what happens. Um, when it comes down to what you can, what you want to accept or decline, you have to just think about that for yourself as, as an individual, I guess. And, um, you know, there are some things that, that are kind of the typical things that some women don't want that they sometimes don't realize they don't have to have. A really good example of that is um, four hourly vaginal exams throughout labor. That's standard protocol um, that they will um, check your dilation every four hours during labor and you will be put on, your dilation will be charted. So it's very, <laughs> you know, you, you become reduced to a graph. <laughs> Um, and if you don't follow the, the graph doesn't follow the right line, then maybe that things aren't right. And a lot of, you know, leading voices have said this is, this shouldn't always, we shouldn't, women are not possible on graphs. We should need to be looking at the woman and tuning into her, not looking at the graph. We need to be looking at the woman. So anyway, so some women think, well, I don't want to have an exam, a routine exam every four hours. I would rather... If, I, if things aren't going along and I don't feel things are moving, then maybe I'll have one. But it'll be when I ask for it, not just to, because it's every, the clock says so. Um, things like that where you want to sort of make a decision. And it's not really like a massive deal. <laughs> it's, you know, it's only a, a, a small thing. But if you want to make decisions like that, the kind of outside of the box, then you need to discuss it in advance with your care providers. Because otherwise, you may find when you get there on the day, people say, well, that's we need to examine you because otherwise you can't get in the pool or whatever. So um, I don't know, it's difficult to answer your question specifically, but I guess just to say that you can make your own decisions about what you want. And I guess I do want to say as well that I'm, I don't want to get a sort of reputation for being the woman who's going around telling everyone to say no to stuff. <laughs> Because it's not, that isn't what it's about. I think it's about the underlying power dynamic in the birth room where you feel that you can say no if you want to. You have bodily autonomy. And the example that I quite often use about that is um, your sexual relationship. So in your sexual relationship, hopefully, whether you've been with your partner for five years, 10 years, 20 years, or 50 years, hopefully you've always known that if you say no at any point, they will respect you saying no. But you may never have said no. You might have always said, yeah. Um, and that's fine. But underneath the surface, there's been that unspoken acknowledgement that you could say no. And that is the dynamic upon which your relationship is built. How different would your relationship be if there was any shadow of doubt in your mind that that no wouldn't stand in the bedroom? So that is the power dynamic, which we sometimes find in the birth room, unfortunately, now, where women it's not about women going in and saying, I don't want it, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this, you out, this, but, you know. It's about knowing that you can say no. And sometimes that is just all that's needed. You then may want to say yes to everything, but you do have autonomy, you do have the right to decline if you want to. And that changes the power dynamic and it changes how you feel. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, just from a practical perspective, and I'll plug them because you haven't. The birth icons, the birth plan oh, icons yeah. that you produced alongside the Positive Birth Book, I found really helpful for creating a birth plan because it lays out the options and your choices really, really clearly. Um, and for me, it felt like when I was communicating them, because it was 
these sort of semi-official looking um, icons about my choices. It wasn't quite me being a mad woman dictating what I wanted off the top of my head and writing a flowery birth plan. Sort of, and I also made it a beautiful table. There were fallbacks. It was it was very professionally done in the end. Did you um, laminate it? It was, it was produced in tri triplicate. Everyone had a copy. Um, Excellent. I presented it to my midwife on our TV. We went through it. She was incredibly. I mean, she was amazing, but also really good at me going through my birth plan. That was quite lucky, but yeah. So yeah, these are little icons that you can. They're in the Positive Birth Book, but you can download them for free from um, pinterandmartin.com forward slash vbp um, and or just Google um, positive birth book, visual birth plan, and they should come up. So it's a free download. There's about 100 icons, and they all represent a different birth choice. So they're quite good fun to sort of think. It makes it easy to make your plan A, plan B, plan C, yeah. plan D, because you can kind of shuffle them around and, and do that kind of visual check of like, well, actually, these things are coming along to plan F too. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question. Let me take one down here. Yeah, actually, how the partner can support the woman to do the right choice? That's a really good question. Um, well, it's how that, you could extrapolate that question out, couldn't you, to like your whole relationship, I suppose. Um, it's, um, it is down to an individual couple to, to work that out between them, I suppose. But obviously, I, for me, it's like, well, the woman is the one who's actually got to do the birthing. So I think she needs to be the key decision maker um, and, and the partner needs to support her but it's a it's a two-way it's a relationship <laughs> so you know I know women who've not had a home birth because their partner hasn't felt comfortable with it not because they're like under some necessarily some kind of patriarchal spell but just because they love their partner and they want their partner to be there and they want their partner to be comfortable so it's not always about like the woman getting everything she wants and you know it's it's complicated um but i think you know i think it's really helpful for partners to be supportive and to get educated as well um it, it's always brilliant you know read the book too some people say will you write a positive birth book for men i'm like i did you can read the one i've already written <laughs> there are no barriers to, to reading it um so yeah learn learn as much as you can as well and that, that is always really helpful and supportive and helps you to be able to support her choices if you know why she's making them. Thank you. So that was a really awesome question to end on. Um, but thank you, Millie. Um, it's been lovely listening to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.